thank you for the warm welcome and uh, opportunity to be here and speak to you and to uh, as many people who I've known for a long time in this room and uh, it's great to be great great to be here. Um, getting ready for this talk, I asked uh, Chantel Forge to uh, give me a list of what was already happening at uh, Concordia in the, in the area of sustainability and rethink. So I got uh, over over two and a, I got about two and a half pages of stuff. So uh, it's great. It's uh, great to see people, you know, coming together in so many different ways to uh, address uh, really uh, crisis time that we're in. Um, and so I, I want to talk about uh, that. I, I'm not. I have the same view of the word sustainability uh, that uh, uh, Homer Dixon has. It's, I, I think it's, a, it's been a useful sort of transition word, but we're in a time now when we need to think much more deeply about the sort of human prospect and human project on the planet, and th that uh, you know, we're moving into a new phase. We're in, we're in the, we've, we've gone, as this quote on the board uh, on the screen shows, we're now in a different uh, geologic era or moving into one, um, and so we, we have to really uh, think very hard about our place in the universe and our place on this planet, and uh, so that's really where I, I want to go today. Uh, I'm not really a um, super big fan of the idea of interdisciplinarity um, because it implies that all the disciplines are in good order, right, and, and I think I'm going to try to argue that some of the disciplines are actually in quite uh, an area, uh, quite <coughs> in disarray, and so uh, simply cooperating across the existing uh, thought structures uh, that are represented in a university is, is not necessarily a good idea. I, I think, in general, the, the sciences <clears throat> are in much better shape than the uh, social sciences and humanities, and that uh, a kind of rapprochement between these different areas of thought is really necessary um, if higher education is to do its part in, in pulling out of the current uh, decline that we're in. Um, I think there's a certain uh, forensic dimension to higher education at this time. Where, that a, a, a great crime is being committed in terms of the loss of this planet to support life, and higher education has a role in that. And I, I think we need to, some of the disciplines have a terrifically important role in unearthing the sort of assumptions that have led to the current uh, difficult situation. And um, so I, I see there's a kind of um, r profound re-examination is necessary uh, in academia and that goes beyond and deeper than the idea of interdisciplinarity. Um, <coughs> so the speech is a little bit complicated, but I'm just going to start with a little metaphor uh, that I hope uh, will give you at least some of the main message. Um, so there's a <coughs> film by uh, Peter Sellers called The Magic Christian. And in this film, he's the wealthiest man in the world. He's holding a meeting of his board members on a train uh, going through the countryside somewhere, and maybe in Yorkshire. Um, <clears throat> and all his companies are, are failing. The profits are down, sales are down, and so forth. So he says, uh, gentlemen, they're all men, he says, uh, you're, you're fired. And uh, the train stops, and he makes them get off the train. And as they get off, he hands each of them a, a map but no map of Yorkshire, right? So map of Auckland, New Zealand, right? Or map of downtown Montreal, but no map of where they are. And um, I think to some extent that's what we're doing in higher education, right? That we're giving you guys maps, but they're not maps of where we are. Um, and so, but you know, in the US you only pay a couple hundred thousand bucks for that, right? In Canada it's a lot less, so. Um, but um, yeah, it's a, serious, it's a serious problem. And I think particularly I'm going to talk about uh, four disciplines that I think are four frameworks of thinking that I think are um, tragically misleading um, economics, finance, law, and governance. Um, so these are sort of non trivial projects, but I think I can make this argument stick. Um, so um, this, is, uh, this is Goya's uh, Saturn devouring his son. It's a sort of gruesome metaphor for sort of what's going on, I think, that, that we're, you know, we're in the process of basically disenabling the future generations. Um, and so I want to try to make that case and then suggest uh, what to do about it. So um, my, my talk really is built around two uh, great worldviews. One is um, the, uh, what I call the Emancipation Project. 
which has sources in uh, Christian and Mu Christ Judeo Christian Muslim thinking and uh, Greek, uh, the Greek, so called Greek Enlightenment of ancient Athens and the European Enlightenment. Um, and then there's a, another worldview that I'm going to draw on also, which is the scientific synthesis of the last 500 years, but in particular, which has developed in very, very important ways since around 1800, where the idea of, of evolution and eventually the idea of complex systems have become the sort of core ideas of a, of a quite different uh, understanding of the human, human place in the world. And much of what is taught in most of the universities I know about, or maybe even, well, not all of them, but most of the universities, uh, is still rests on worldview number one, right? And, and this causes a pretty big distortion, I think, in uh, how we think and how we understand our, our place in the world. So um, Al Albert Schweitzer, one of my great heroes, uh, probably most of the younger people in this room never heard of him, but was sort of the major figure in world civilization in the first part of the 20th century. Um, argued that we're not going to, we're going to have a really bad century, that is the 20th century, uh, because we're lost, right? We, we don't have an ethical system, and uh, the reason we don't have an ethical system is we don't have a theory of the universe, right? We don't, we don't know where, how we fit into the cosmic story. And um, so Schweitzer kind of despaired of, of the century, and it turned out to be uh, a mess, right? Um, uh, huge wars, depression, and then in from sort of 1950 on, the enthusiastic dismemberment of the life support systems of the planet, right? So it's a, it's a dog of a century. Um, but uh, in a way, we're, we're in a privileged position because we do have a theory of the universe, right? And so what we have to do is try to use that theory, figure out uh, who we are and, and where we should be headed, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first uh, uh, idea, or the first worldview I want to talk about is what I am and many other people have called the Emancipation Project. Um, this is a project to free ourselves from nature, right? So we d can distance ourselves from nature. We can technologize nature. We don't have to, we're not really living in nature. Um, we emancipate ourselves from others. We, we don't have ob strong obligations to other peoples. This has been something that has legitimated uh, colonialism, empire, right? And uh, now the current, in my view, uh, uh, so-called free trade um, agenda, um, and then we also have freedom from ourselves, right, that we're, a we're able to, uh, in a way, adjust the human person to, to fit uh, the needs of modernity rather than fitting modernity to fit the needs of the, of the human person. So uh, there are lots of other factors that have brought about the, the current um, pretty bad situation. Some of them are our agriculture, some is technology. Some, the money supply, too many people, and so forth. I'm not talking about this. I'm just talking about the ideational feature of this set of dilemmas. Um, so um, this project is embedded in a, uh, a failed master narrative um, that comes from, uh, particularly from Judeo-Christian sources. And I, I want to talk about that, and I'm going to rely on a really terrific piece of analysis by Carolyn Merchant, um, a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, and her <coughs> she wrote a book called uh, Reinventing Eden, the Fate of Nature in Western Culture. A uh, very, very powerful piece of analysis. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, so her argument basically is that the, this narrative is, an, is a narrative of expulsion um, redemption and recovery, right? So that, so that we're, we've been thrown out of paradise because of the fall, right? The world itself fell because of, of the human fall. If you read the first books of the, of the book of Genesis, uh, first chapters of the book of Genesis. And so now, now the, the project, the Western project, is to recover paradise, to get, get paradise back. Uh, and she makes a really, a really convincing uh, argument about this. So. What's, what's on the screen is, is I hope, pretty familiar. Um, it occurred to me when I, when I first taught at McGill that everybody knew the first three books of Genesis, so that I, I gave a class and I just I didn't even bother to produce the reading. I assumed everybody already read it and no reason to do it. And of course, uh, that turned out to be completely wrong, right? Most of the students didn't even know exactly what the three books of, first three books of Genesis were. And then one of the students said, 
well, how do you get a Bible, right? And so I thought, well, okay, that's, just, just let that question sit for a minute. And then one of them raised his hand and he said, I know how, you check into a hotel and you steal it. <laughs> right? So, so uh, yeah, that, would, that never occurred to me, actually. But, uh, so, so anyway, on the left here is the creation of man in God's image. Uh, in the middle is the creation of, of Eve, uh, taken from the rib of Adam. And then in, in the, uh, on the extreme right, uh, from your point of view, is the, uh, is the, the temptation of man by, by Eve and, and the fall, right? So the um, bringing about uh, catastrophe both for humanity and, and for uh, the natural world, according to this narrative. If, if you'll notice that uh, right here, there's a second woman's face, and that's because that's, that's the head of the snake, right? So this is a very, uh, this is sort of a friendly story from a, a woman's point of view. Um, but um, so, so um, another feature of this narrative is that God gives the world to, human, to men, it does not to humans, but to men. Um, and um, that, as I already mentioned, uh, humans are made in the, in the image of God. We're, we're separate from the rest of creation in this story, right? We're, we are, we're, a speci we're specially created by God, uh, independent of the other um, plants, uh, independent of the plants and animals. And there's also in this, built into this notion, um, the idea that there's a, um, a great chain of being, that, that the closer you are to the divine, the better you are, and the further you are from the divine, um, the worse you are and, and the more simply instrumental you are. So this is, take a long time to explain this, but God at the top, rocks at the bottom. Right? That's the sort of main idea. And the universe proceeds from God in this, in this narrative. Um, so the consequence of, um, of the fall is to be banished uh, forever from paradise. Right, so, so uh, this is uh, Cole's, uh, Thomas Cole's expulsion from the garden, painted around 1830, I think. And so we're, the, the light part to the right is the perfect world, right? It's a, it's a nice stream, it's warm, there's plenty of good food and so forth. And um, then we're thrown from the garden, the, the sword of cherubim is put up to block our re-entry to it, and we're kept forever in the howling, uh, desolate wilderness of um, Quebec. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, um, so, so how this uh, works in in terms of how this has played out over over history, uh, according to Carolyn, and I, I really think this is a very convincing uh, piece of analysis, is um, that this legitimates then the transformation of nature. It legitimates the, the the building of higher of institutions of higher education like this one. Um, and, but, but they're, this, they're integral to the narrative, right? Because they are the means by which we get, our, get paradise back, right? We're, we're, we've been illegitimately expelled from paradise, and now we have the opportunity through the arts and sciences to get, our, to get back to paradise. And um, in, the, um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the enabling tools of this come along in the form of capitalism. Uh, and um, um, technology and technological revolution, uh, revolutions, uh, many of whom, uh, many of which uh, Tad Dixon talked about last night. Tad Homer Dixon talked about last night. Um, so we can recover our place in paradise, according to this narrative, and the universities fit into this story in a, in a very, very important way. In the way that Bacon, Francis Bacon, justified. Um, public expenditures on the, the increase in knowledge. Um, so one of the consequences of this has been um, the, <clears throat> the triumph of the West, right? That we, we are, we meaning technological people, such as most of the people in this room, or maybe everybody in this room, um, we, we are, we've been able to, through our technological prowess, uh, through our culture, through our, uh, through our religious beliefs and so forth, to, to dominate um, the world, and, or coming to dominate the world. Um, and this is an um, unabashed version of that, right? that uh, to progress is defined as the removal of the uh, indigenous peoples, the pushing away of, the, of, the, uh, of wildlife, um, the, and ultimately the industrialization of the North American continent. 
Um, so this, this is uh, almost uh, two century and a half ago now, this painting, but uh, it's a completely, it's a celebration of impending catastrophe. Um, so anyway, this is a successful project, right? Uh, paradise has been regained, right? So um, if you look at this, uh, it is in a way a reconstruction of the garden, right? This is the Edmonton Mall. Um, so if you've got palm trees, nice and warm, take a swim, right? And you can, you know, everything that you could want, you can have. You can have Diet Coke and potato chips any time of the day, right? I mean, it's really a great, great success. Um, so I, I think this is, um, that's a very, to me at least, that's a very convincing um, narrative of, of how, how we got there and what legitimated what's, what's turning out to be something that's not really working. Um, so I, I just want to point to um, one thing here uh, that in the, particularly in the first, in the Ten Commandments, one, one thing that's um, interesting about this list is that the earth is not mentioned. Um, in most uh, older uh, cosmologies or most o older ethical systems, there's some notion of the worship of the sun, the worship of water, the worship of the earth, and so forth, right? Um, but uh, didn't, it didn't make this list. Um, now, it doesn't mean that there aren't elements within the Judeo-Christian tradition which do respect the earth. There definitely are, particularly in the Hebrew Bible. There's some very, very important passages. Um, but the, the main direction of this religious tradition, in which I was raised, by the way, um, is away from respect for the earth, not toward it, in my view. Um, so um, here are some of the ways that I think it's, it's led us in, a, in perhaps not the best direction. Um, it locates um, <coughs> the sacred principally in the transcendent, right, as opposed to in the material and the imminent. Right? Um, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? So it locates, it locates the, the sacred somewhere else, right? Um, the American, uh, Spanish American philosopher uh, Santiana said that uh, religion uh, should be understood as reverence for the sources of our being. And so I'm going to make an argument a bit later that, that the sacred. Uh, is in the material sources of our being, not in the transcendent. And that, and that there, a, a re-examination of the human-earth relationship, human-universe relationship, is necessary uh, to come up with a <clears throat> sense of the sacred that should inform um, uh, our relationship to our planet. Um, in, the <clears throat> in the narrative of uh, the first three books of Genesis, the earth becomes fallen and it needs to be reclaimed, right? So, so we, the, in the United States, they have the Bureau of Reclamation. That's the big dam-making, swamp-draining, landscape-altering project, right? It's because if it isn't useful to us, it, it has to be converted into something that's useful to us. Uh, it also has the consequence, much later in, in the way this narrative plays out, of defining the principal human-earth relationship as one of property. Right? Um, not as one of respect. And it, this also, um, because of the construction of ma human beings, the object of special creation and everything else is more ordinary, to say the least, um, there's, this lacks a balance uh, between the requirements of humans and other species. Um, <clears throat> and so, so, for instance, the concept food security, right? So you hear that concept a lot now, but I often say, well, what about food security for woodchucks, you know, and, and chipmunks and um, um, porcupines, um, that's not usually thought of, usually. It's food security for persons. Um, and this, this has this, the way of sort of uh, continuing this notion that it's, it's, it's mainly us that matters. Um, and lastly, for I'll come back to this a little bit later, um, this tradition lacks traction with the problems of the Anthropocene. Right? Um, so in a way, our ethical systems are obsolete. I'm not saying they're wrong. So the Ten Commandments is <clears throat> a good set of rules for a small group of people in a large place. Right? It's very, very, uh, you know, it's a great, I don't disagree with any of these uh, <clears throat> particularly, maybe number two, but um, 
But it's not a good set of rules to rely on if there's a large number of people in a small place, right, which is what, what we've got now, right? So we've got, got a sort of mismatch between the problems that we've got and the ethical systems that we try to bring to bear. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So consequences of the Emancipation Project is, I don't know how many of you have seen this diagram before. Um, it's from uh, <coughs> Rockstrom's paper, Safe Living Space for Humanity. Um, and it shows that we're overrunning the Earth's uh, life support systems. So this, uh, r the red bars are biodiversity loss, climate change, and um, excessive production, I think, of nitrogen. Um, so uh, the project is sort of overrunning the planet on which it's trying to survive. And we're losing, um, <coughs> losing large numbers of other species and large, num large numbers of members of other species, both. So uh, planets is in, is in decline. And we have basically a, a population and consumption crisis. We've got too many people, and we've got too many rich people in particular, uh, but too many people uh, altogether in terms of how we support ourselves, how, how we what we consume. So as an American uh, folk song, or country and western song, I'm using the Bible as my road map, right? And so what I'm suggesting is if you're losing, you're using your Bible as a, your road map, you're lost, right? Um, this is a set of beliefs that are d incompatible with contemporary scientific thought. Um, and so we are, we continue to think in ways uh, that, that don't actually fit our circumstances. So that's why I say we have maps, but they're not maps of where we are. Um, okay, so uh, second world view I want to talk about is one merging since, uh, since about 1800, princi principally uh, took a big step forward in the work of Charles Darwin, obviously. Uh, a lot's happened in the, in the 20th century to sort of give credence to this as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an integrating framework. Um, it's not perfect. It may get overturned later on. Who knows? Um, but you know, so far as a lot of, uh, of evidence that this, this system, is, this way of thinking is, is empirically verified and is a coherent framework for thinking about things. Um, so, so this would be, um, I put this slide in here because it might be news to many economists, right? Because um, you know, that we're part of the universe and we're subject to the laws of the universe is a fact, right? Um, and um, where we um, have this notion of ourselves as independent that's incompatible with, with uh, the fact that we're biological, uh, physical, material creatures. Um, in this kind of a worldview, the great chain of being gets turned upside down, right? Because it, it isn't um, rocks come first, mind comes last, right? So the material sources, uh, the material universe, been in existence roughly 13.8 billion years or so. Life on Earth's been here about 3.8 billion. Um, and um, the um, mind only emerged, at least in the part of the universe we know about, r reasonably recently. Um, so, my, so the narrative is, back, the Christian, Judeo-Christian narrative is backwards, right? The mind didn't precede the universe. The universe produces mind as an emergent, proce emergent property of, um, of life, not just human life. Um, so looked at this way, I, I chose to introduce this using Whitehead's phrase, um, <coughs> a universe uh, continually evolving into novelty. Um, so there's a vast creative process. The universe is, already, is still creating itself, is still unfolding in a way. Um, much of this can be understood through contemporary uh, thermodynamics in, um, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute, mind, mind is emergent from this process. And uh, once you look at this thing, things this way, you have to change your metaphysics or your, your intellectual framework to one of membership in commonwealth of life. So this is just a, obviously a rather crude rendering of the idea of the Big Bang. Um, I'm starting a, a, a program uh, with McGill and University of Vermont and, and uh, York University and the opening course in the program is going to be called From the Big Bang to the Anthropocene. Right? How, did we, how did you get from this event, or what we think was an event, right, to the present? Um, and so th this is a slide from uh, NASA 
a, a picture. Uh, this is called the Pillars of Creation. These are our uh, great gas columns that are, are under bombardment. And when, as the bombardment goes on, they form new things like our sun, right? So they're new, new sun-like things are coming into being all the time. Others are expiring, obviously. Um, so this is a, a process in which we're a, a small part. And um, in, looked at this way, um, biological evolution is a special case, right? So the universe is an, is a, an evolving process. Uh, with life coming along reasonably late in the process, late in that process, um, a principal descriptor of this is the second law of thermodynamics. Um, not everybody knows what that law is, and a lot of people have trouble grasping it. And I, I did when I first started to think about it. The easy way to grasp it is: this won't be funny to most of you in here, but it'll be funny to some of us. It's what happens to your car when you lend it to your teenage son. Right? It sort of just inexorably goes down, right? Um, and see, I'm getting a laugh from people of a certain age in here and a sort of frown from uh, probably the majority of the audience, right? It's better not to think about it. Um, so so uh, basically, the second law of thermodynamics says that things uh, will come into equilibrium with, with their environment. So this bottle of water probably once was cold, right, and now it's, uh, it's room temperature. Um, n nature, another way to phrase this is nature abhors a gradient, right? Wherever there's a gradient, na the natural world will, will try to get rid of that gradient. And that's the way in, in a very simple description of how the emergence, uh, the, 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 the unfolding of the universe is playing out. There, there is that the universe is, in, a, in another sense, trying to cool itself off, right? There's a, there's a temperature gradient, a huge temperature gradient in the universe. And you go, it's, it, the unfolding creative process of the universe takes place because it's trying to get rid of that, that gradient. Um, a, a lot, this is called, also called the entropy law. Um, and a lot of progress was made in thinking this through in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s by uh, Prigogine and by uh, James Kay and, and uh, Schneider and a number of other people. Um, so the universe <coughs> uses um, what are called dissipative structures, that is, ways of degrading energy. So I'm a dissipative structure, right? I'm, I'm using up energy as I'm talking and so forth, and I'm, I'm dissipating that in the form of heat. Um, and it uses self-organizing entities like, like human beings and like um, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and so forth. These are, these are vast dissipative structures that organize themselves, right? So the, the, the picture that uh, Tad showed last night of, of Hurricane Sandy, that's a, both a dissipative structure, it's dissipative and self-organizing structure. And what um, came about um, in uh, the 1990s and so forth is people began to say, well, life, life itself is a dissipative structure. Life, life is, an, is an opportunity that the universe has created to help cool itself off. Uh, I'm not going to go over the balance of this slide here. So, so looked at this way, um, the Earth is an island of complexity in an entropic universe, an island of complexity in a universe in which is at once getting more and more complex in some places, like here, but more and more simple elsewhere in, because of, of the effects of thermodynamics. So life is, is on Earth. It, it, life is it, our life on Earth is an encoded uh, dissipative structure, which can handle massive amounts of sunlight that continuously arrive on Earth. Looked at from this framework. So if you have this cosmology, we need to think differently about our relationship with life in the world, and we need to reconstruct a, um, a notion of of a sacred relationship and move to a mutually enhancing relationship with our planet, and we need to think, rethink cosmic citizenship. So I'm now going to try to place higher education in, in this uh, revision that I think is, is necessary. Um, so I think that, that there are, the, the main idea of this next section coming is very simple, that there are a collection of disciplines that are more or less still embedded in narrative number one, and a set of disciplines that are more or less embedded in narrative number two. Right? And that, so there's a kind of misfit here between, between them. 
in, in, in the scientific disciplines, for the most part, there's a, a project of mutual criticism across the, dis across the scientific disciplines and a certain integration across those disciplines. But in, um, in the social sciences and humanities, that's not especially true. Um, it's more mixed, it's not completely absent. Um, and so I, I think some of the, um, of the, uh, are the social science and humanities are teaching people something which is profoundly untrue. Um, and so that's, that's what I call the orphan disciplines. Um, it's a metaphor, basically, that just suggests that, um, <clears throat> like, like a human orphan, if, if, uh, if your parents, uh, a human orphan is someone whose parents are dead, but he or she isn't. Um, and so the typical notion is that an orphan, depending on the age, of course, should be uh, perhaps adopted. And so uh, by analogy, an orphan discipline is a discipline um, whose metaphysical and scientific assumptions have collapsed, but it still has substantial influence on pedagogy and practice. Um, and the, the ones that I think are, are uh, that I, I define as the, the North, the, the, the um, orphan disciplines are economics, finance, law, governance, and ethics. Um, and um, they're, that's not the whole set, but those are the ones that are explicitly contain information that say, to tell us what we should do, right? That, that they, they have prescriptive content, these disciplines. So I think the worst, worst one is economics. Um, and it principally has, um, there's been no systematic con connection between mainstream economics and scientific discoveries for the last 200 years, uh, except behavioral economics rather recently. Um, and so the, this is a kind of, a, um, you know, I'm not saying that, that all, econ I'm not saying all economists have that characteristic. I'm just saying if you look at the mainstream texts in economics, they, they are not in sync at all with the contemporary scientific worldview. Um, <clears throat> so the, the economy is a closed system with no connection to material and energy flows. Uh, economic actors obey the fixed decision rules. Um, the universe is subject to Newtonian mechanics. There are no biophysical limits to expansion. And it's foolish to interfere in market dynamics. Those are all elements of, I think, conventional main, mainstream economics. And those are reasonably plausible views to hold in uh, maybe when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, 1776. But uh, they're implausible now. Um, and so, so this is a highly regrettable uh, way of thinking. And I think is, is one of the principal contributors to the decline in the Earth's life support systems. Um, so what, what, we've, um, what we've done is to leave the, the governance of the planet more and more to uh, the central bankers, as Mark Carney, former um, head of Bank of Canada, now head of the Bank of England, and Janet Demir, I can't remember her last name right now, just sworn in to follow Ben Bernanke as head of the uh, Federal Reserve. Um, I have a textbook written by Bernanke and two other economists, and, <clears throat> and I looked up um, issues like climate change, species loss, uh, environmental crisis, all that kind of thing. There are either no entries or you referred to page 30 where there's a green box. And in the green box there are two sentences that says <clears throat> something like this. Ideally the economic indicators would, would give us the means to judge uh, the, re the relationship between the economy and the Earth's natural resources. Unfortunately, they do not. That's on page 30 of about a 600-page book. Uh, so if you look at the behavior of the Federal Reserve um, in the so-called quantitative easing, um, the, the whole project is to stimulate additional economic growth of any character, just about any legal character. Um, and the issue of the fit between the economy and the planet doesn't come up, right? So. Um, so this is, in my view, um, a 
crime. Uh, because it is imperiling the well-being of hundreds of millions of people, and it is impoverishing, perhaps destroying the future. Um, so here's some more problems with this idea that it's everybody knows that GMPs just doesn't measure what we're really trying to find out. Um, it imagines that the economy is a closed system, not open to energy and matter. Um, has no concept of biological limits, and it avoids uh, paying attention to issues of aggregate scale, such as the size of the human population and the fairness of the distribution of income and wealth. Um, <clears throat> so finance, whether this is a discipline or whether this is just sort of an appendage of economics, I guess you could debate that. Um, it has almost all of the same assumptions of, of um, economics. Um, economic growth is always good. More money means more wealth, and <clears throat> inflation is the only indicator of too much money, and which can be controlled by the central banks. Uh, relationship of the quantity of money to the size of the earth is, is at least as far as I can tell, in the, most of the, some of the readings in finance I've done, not thought about. There is a whole movement now to rethink money and to rethink finance, and some of the people, a small number of people who are writing in that in those fields. Uh, are trying to think about the relationship between money supply and earth supply, but uh, in general it's, it's not a, a main area of concentration. So this is a complicated graph. The only thing I want you to get out of this is that between the early 1980s and 2008, when this ends, the amount of, the number of financial instruments, credit cards, bank, you know, uh, checks, mortgages, derivatives, and so forth, expanded by at least 200%. But the Earth didn't expand at all, right? So the, the claims on the Earth are vastly larger than they used to be, right? Um, but the Earth is the same size or maybe smaller because of life support systems declining. So um, also this is a, the argument about ethics being obsolete. It's from a book by uh, Hans Jonas um, called uh, The Imperative of Responsibility. And so Jonas basically makes, makes a point that our ethical systems, both from the Judeo-Christian sources and Greek sources, um, came from a time when the human impact on the earth was small, um, and the city was where, uh, where people lived, that was where the civilized people lived, and the city defined the moral community. Athenians had obligations to Athenians, but they had none to Spartans and, and Melians and so forth. When they captured uh, Mil Milos, uh, they killed them all. Um, and um, it's also, this is just true of the mainstream, there are many parts of Western culture and other cultures in which this is not true, but, but in Western culture, I think this is a, these are fair generalizations. Um, the relationship to the natural world is ethically neutral. All ethics is human to human or human to God. Where we live is not the object of, of technical manipulation. Proximity in time and space is assumed that we're, our, our duties are to other people we see and interact with, right? And there's no, you don't have to know anything special to be a moral person. In the Anthropocene, a lot of these assumptions are, are wrong, right? Because we have basically, it's a, we're large with respect to the, to the earth. Um, we have obligations to people we never see. Uh, technical knowledge, such as the, the, what was displayed by Tad last night, is essential, right? You have to have long-term, very complicated, uh, contentious, sometimes contentious uh, issues arise about, about the characteristics of the future, but to be a moral person in the present, you have to be able to at least grasp or to at least accept that others grasp uh, this, this kind of technical knowledge. Okay, I want to say a little bit about law here. Um, comes uh, most important document on, um, on that gives, that underlies <coughs> um, Anglo-Saxon culture and property law is chapter five of, of uh, <coughs> John Locke's uh, treatise on civil government, uh, the second treatise on civil government. Um, and these are some of the assumptions that Locke makes to, in order to justify human property in law. Uh, the earth is a gift from <coughs> God to men. Um, ownership up arises because if you, private property allows for um, 
the improvement of the earth for the benefit of humans, but it doesn't mention the benefit of other species. Um, it is, um, <clears throat> you, can, you can own as much as you want provided you um, leave enough and as good left over for other persons. Property is divisible into tracks, right? So you can, you can draw lines on the map and I own, I own this and Jeanette owns something else, right? So it's divisible in a way. Um, and ownership provides incentives for long-term care. So those are our assumptions, all of which are highly questionable, looked at from an evolutionary point of view. So um, this is a picture uh, taken of, of people um, in um, North, in British Columbia, I believe. And they, they are quoted as saying, they, meaning Europeans, draw magic lines in the land that only they can see, right? So, so land is essentially non-severable uh, from an ecological point of view, but Western conception of property, imagine it is severable. Okay, governance. Um, so this is very complicated, and I only want to say, I only want to make two arguments about governance. One is that <coughs> the idea <coughs> Of, the, uh, <clears throat> of a society based on which liberty is the basic value is incompatible with uh, fundamental moral rules and <clears throat> the Anthropocene taken together. And second, that the nation state uh, itself is a big mistake, um, <clears throat> the so-called sovereign nation state. Um, Okay, so the, the key thing to look at is the bottom here of this slide. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here's a painting by Jean Ferris of, um, of this, uh, the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. That's Jefferson on the right, uh, Adams in the middle, and Franklin on the left. And you'll notice that there's a lot of scrap paper on the floor. Um, and I, my view of this meeting is it's, you know, I don't think all the mistakes made it to the floor, right? A lot of the mistakes are in the document itself. Um, and this is a, an extremely flawed way of, of thinking about uh, the human condition and our relationships with each other. This is just a picture of the declaration. So um, the pr there, there are a number of premises here, and then the only one I'm really going to mention, um, it, well, two, the natural right of liberty and, and, the, and the idea of the nation state are the ones that I'm going to criticize. I, I think there's plenty wrong with it that I'm not talking about, but just because of time. So um, the notion that liberty is, is the fundamental value. W one of the principles of a good speech, I think, is work in neutrality, whatever you can really get, you know, really works, right? So uh, try to... Try to get equal opportunity nudity is my, my goal here, right? Um, so, um, so one of the problems is that when we fly or burn fossil fuels, we kill other people and other species in at least two different ways, right? Um, one, um, so there's something really fundamentally wrong with our whole lifestyle. If you accept a rule like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? You can't live the way we live and, and obey that rule, the second rule, right? Um, so here's how it does it in two ways. One is fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels basically reduces the future fertilizer supply of the earth, right? M about half of the people in this room are, are alive because of the Haber-Bosch process, which is a process of basically creating uh, inexpensive fertilizer through nitrogen fixation and, um, and then using that basically to grow large amounts of cheap food. It's okay so far as it goes. But when you, you burn fossil fuel, like as in to heat your house or you know, fly to Jamaica for the weekend or that kind of thing, you're reducing the, the future f fertilizer supply, the present and future fertilizer supply. And the second thing is, of course, this carbon sink is, is already filled, right? So as Tad was talking about last night, we keep pouring more and more stuff into something that's already saturated. And this is bringing about desertification, right? sea level rise. Everybody in this room knows all this stuff. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so the problem is for liberal, liberal democracy is <clears throat> that there's a, a, in the Anthropocene, there's a clash between 
the biophysical characteristics of the planet and what almost everybody in every culture accepts as a fundamental moral rule, the reciprocity rule, right? Do unto others you would have them do unto you. So <clears throat> I, I think it's, it's, um, it's impossible, I, I can't find any way out of this, put it this way, maybe somebody smarter than I can can figure out how, how to get out of this pretty big dilemma. Um, <clears throat> but in a, in a finite world, harm is inevitable to, to other people, right? Uh, maybe this wasn't true when Jefferson wrote, but it's, I think it's true now. So I think in, in the Anthropocene, you have to recognize that liberty lives in a modest room in the mansion of justice, right? So, so justice has to be a fundamental moral principle for the governance of, of the human place on the earth. Liberty can't, and then liberty is a subordinate to the requirements of justice. Um, <clears throat> then the other, the other main point I want to make about this is just what's on this globe <clears throat> that assumes that, that Jefferson assumes that the nation state is the, the right sort of um, locus, locus of, of governmental, of, of legitimacy. Um, but we all know that, that this isn't at all what the world's actually like. Right? And uh, the nation state's uh, system has failed to adequately protect, or protect even at all, except for the Montreal Protocol, Earth's life support systems, right? So, so there's almost no success story out there, almost none. Climate sy failed system, biodiversity systems failing, right? uh, oceans are basically in, in very steep decline in terms of fish and other wildlife. And if you do what Tad was suggesting might be done last night is you go to a couple of centuries of geoengineering to control the temperature, but you don't control carbon emissions, that's the ball game for the ocean because it'll get even further acidified, right? Which is already radically acidified. So, um, so this is a monumental failure of humanity to uh, deal with the reality of life on our planets. Uh, in the in the negotiations, <clears throat> each nation tries to maximize its position, but nobody is there on an advocate for an advocate for the whole, and so these have failed. So I want to now uh, talk just uh, briefly in conclusion about <clears throat> um, how we could uh, turn the corner on some of these things and uh, <clears throat> try to make a, um, to try to reconstruct um, our place in, on this planet and in the universe. This is a map, uh, I got our diagram, <clears throat> I got um, from uh, John Fullerton, somebody I work with a lot, uh, who's uh, head of a place called the Capital Institute. So the, the fundamental notion here is captured, I, I hope, by this diagram that in, in the, we have to ground, uh, reground a set of disciplines on both our scientific knowledge of the world, which is now well advanced, not, not perfect by any means, and we have to rest though this reconceptual, reconceptualization on an idea, of, a, a redefined idea of the sacred. And so the, the problem looked at from this point of view is to rebuild these disciplines or these frameworks of thinking, if you like, um, around, on, uh, in a manner consistent with the sacredness of the earth and our current understanding of our place in the universe. And then that, that should, if, you, if Concordia um, advances what was on Chantel's email, then that should percolate through society in for a, an entirely different social and economic order. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. So, um, so this would get us from uh, foe to friend, um, and I just want to say a little bit about what it would mean for each of these, these disciplines that I've been so, or frameworks of thought that I've been so critical of. So <clears throat> for, um, for economics, you have to start any economic system that's, that's can, to be taken seriously has to start with the characteristics of the planet. Uh, these are uh, taken from um, Kenneth Boulding. Um, the planet is open to energy. Um, so um, the, the economy has to be open to energy. We have to reconceptualize the economic system entirely. So it recognizes that the earth is, is open to this continuous energy flow, but is closed to matter. So the closed to matter feature is very important because the closed to matter feature is why these sinks are getting overloaded, right? So we put the carbon out there, there's no place for it to go other than somewhere else on the earth. So 
economics has to be grounded in earth science. That's a sort of short message for that. For finance, um, we have to start with the idea that money is not the basic unit of wealth. It's photosynthesis. Um, and so if we want to be rich, right, we should care for uh, that which makes life possible, which is uh, pl uh, plants, basically, um, and uh, be in the process of restoring and rebuilding uh, the Earth's uh, um, biophysical um, plant systems. Um, for finance also, um, we have to limit the quantity of investment. Somehow there has to be some relationship between the total amount of investment that occurs and the ability of the planet to cope with that investment, right? To, to be able to, to uh, absorb the waste stream, to provide for the investment and to absorb the waste stream from, uh, from the investment. We also have to target, so we're in a, we're in a system of decline at this point. So we need to, to target the kind of investment we make so that we're basically regenerating the Earth's life support systems, right? not further um, destroying them. Um, so the overarching goal of investment has to be basically to deal with the, <clears throat> with the Anthropocene and to turn, turn around um, the current decline. So for, <clears throat> for law, um, I think a, a basic point of departure, and I, I put uh, Jeff Garver's name here because he's somebody I've worked very closely with and has advanced my thinking about on this quite a bit. We have to start <coughs> building a, a legal system, uh, again, on, on the characteristics of how this planet works, not on the human. So in Jefferson's view, the, the human, human relationship to the Earth is one of property. Um, in, in Garber's view, the human relationship to, to the Earth is one of respect, right? And so we, we build then a legal system based on what we know about ecological knowledge and then re make that the foundation of the legal system, not the characteristics of the person and his or her, her desires. And then governance, basically, um, Pretty simple is we have to start over with the notion that, that what we have to govern is the human pro project on the planet. And um, because it's a set of uh, interacting systems and that, that the <coughs> elements of global governance, in, in my view, uh, include some sort of global legislative body uh, that, would, that would be able to pass laws that would restrict and direct the human project. We need to establish trusts for the commons, uh, like the oceans and the atmosphere. We need to have an analytical, a global analytical capacity to understand how the Earth functions and, and whether we're living within uh, the, the sort of boundaries of, of a healthy functioning. And then we need some sort of compulsory court to compel nations, uh, individuals, and corporations who are non, in noncompliance. Uh, so just talk a little bit about ethics here. Um, so how do we, so if, if you connect, so what I've tried to do with the, with the uh, idea of, of thermodynamics and the golden rule is to say what would, what would these two things conflict, right? So uh, what would ethics look like if you take seriously evolutionary cosmology and also the second law of thermodynamics? And he, there, these are my Quick answers, I've brought something along that explains some of this. It's longer if you're interested in it. Um, one is we have, to be, we have to view ourselves as members, right, of, of the biological communities where we are um, the products of co-evolution bet between ourselves, other life forms, and the planet. Uh, so uh, the notion of special creation that's in uh, Judeo-Christian thought has to be set aside, and we have to think about ourselves as belonging to a living community. Secondly, we have to, uh, if you want to have a, a healthy community, you have to take care of the house, right? This is not a complicated idea, right? You don't want your house to be dirty and full of things that will kill off your family, right? So if you think that the family is, is the community of life, then that leads you to, to caring for the earth. And then entropic thrift suggests that since um, <clears throat> we have to be... Uh, careful stewards of the things that make life possible, right? The things that make far from equilibrium systems such as us possible. These are things like fossil fuels, sunlight, photosynthesis, and things like that. So we have, we have to, to be 
shepherds or, or careful users of, of the uh, physical conditions for life. Um, and then I just want to say a, a little bit about citizenship and then uh, just one, one uh, quick slide after this. So um, the goal of, of university education is citizens, is to, is to construct citizens. Um, and so I, what is a citizen? So there's a, a really good book by James Carr's called Finite and Infinite Games. Um, <clears throat> and he distinguishes between finite games, which are games like hockey and football and um, baseball and things like that, where there's a, a given place where the game is played, a set of rules, a defined number of players, and the object of the game is to win. And he says, well, okay, there's another set of games, which are infinite games, where there's no set place, there's no particular set of rules, there's no particular limit to the, to the, to the players, and the objective of the game is to keep the game going. Right? Um, so higher education is an infinite game, right? There's no winning in higher education. This, what we're part of a community of people who go last, who presumably come last many centuries, maybe many millennia, and we're in the project of, of discovering and improving uh, the human condition, and in my view, the condition of life on our planet. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're uh, a citizen is is somebody who is a finite player in an infinite game. And the infinite game is looked at from this point of view um, is um, the infinite game of well, it's infinite. We don't really know one way or the other, but. It's a very long-lasting game uh, in, which, uh, chemical, in which evolution, chemical, biological, ethical, cultural, economic, and spiritual, uh, occur with the purpose of uh, ensuring a flourishing Earth. Right? So, so that's, we're, we are, each of us, really very small players in a cosmic narrative of, of enormous importance. And I put T.J. here, Thomas Jefferson, because Jefferson saw human beings as embedded in a cosmic narrative. He just saw us embedded in a cosmic narrative that we've rejected. Right? So we need to uh, get back to this um, idea of being sort of citizens of the universe, players in the universe, citizens of the universe, and uh, also to uh, recognize that we live in a place that's already sacred. Sacred isn't something way out there that's hard to find. It's everywhere. And um, this is a photo I took of, or my daughter took, of um, Brook Trout Sanctuary I've helped to establish in the state of Maryland. So thank you very much. <laughs>